Hello class, welcome to your lecture on Heidegger's own philosophy of art and his critique of aesthetics. Definitely don't attempt to watch this video without first watching last week's video on Heidegger's critique of Nietzsche's aesthetics. You can get the basic thrust of Heidegger's approach by noticing two things from the lecture last week. A, that Heidegger still has sympathy for Schelling or Hegel's concept of art as a presentation of the absolute, but that B, he wants to rethink the relationship of art and truth in terms of the artwork itself. We haven't talked too much about Heidegger's background and biography in general, and it's a complicated subject matter. After achieving worldwide recognition and fame for the publication of his major work, Being in Time, Heidegger became increasingly interested in art and poetry, and his writings revolutionized the philosophy of art in more ways than one. In fact, it may not be an exaggeration to say that the 1935 The Origin of the Work of Art essay is one of the most influential essays on art ever written. The first draft of the essay was written in 1934 or 5 and first delivered in Freiburg. On reflection, I think I like this version better since it's more succinct and to the point and lacks many of the long philosophical digressions that make reading the more complete version quite difficult. So I'm going to be scanning and uploading this as an alternative to the anthologized selection. Heidegger's own project in the origin of the work of art essay is to think art and the artwork in terms of being itself or the truth of being, and he believes that this overcomes the nihilism in regards to the essence of art that he still found in Nietzsche's aesthetics. For Heidegger, art opens up to us in the setting upon of art, i.e. in the work. The thingly character of the work is important, but it is not what the artwork itself reveals. The work of art cannot be reduced to the presence of a mere thing. In fact, the artwork is non-representational. It cannot be thought on the basis of the presence of something in the world at all. Heidegger's startling proposal is that the artwork itself is a becoming and a happening of truth. One thing should matter to Heidegger to prepare a transformed basic relationship of our existence to art while recognizing what has long been said with regard to the determination of the essence of art. Where shall we look for art's origin or Ursprung? We must return to the first line of the essay here where Heidegger writes that origin means that from which and by which something is what it is and as it is. What something is as it is we call its essence. The German here is Ursprung and Wesen. What Heidegger is saying is that in order to understand where something comes from, how it is what it is, how it comes to be, when we understand this, then we understand the way of being or presencing of the thing, its essence. This is a remarkably ambitious project. Heider is going to tell us not only where art comes from, its Ursprung, but from its Ursprung, he's going to tell us what art essentially is. Heidegger does note that what art is can be gathered to some extent from a comparative analysis of actual artworks, but that we can never be sure if we've gotten art right on this basis if we do not beforehand understand the essence of art. This leads Heidegger into a hermeneutic or interpretive circle between the artwork, the essence of art, and our understanding or thinking, and how that is augmented and enhanced into a feast by art. The first view that Heidegger explores in regards to art's origin is indirectly Nietzsche's. Should we look for the origin of art from the artist's presentation? That is, the artist's bringing forth of art, or Hörvorbringen? When we do so, we locate art and its origin in the artistic thought, in the imagination, and in the transfer of that thought into the artwork. Art becomes a purely intellectual process, transferring more or less fully into the work. And the cult of the artistic personality who lives out art is founded. This is not an adequate starting point. We all know that in great art, the artist is something trivial in regards to the reality of his work. Quote, almost like a passage that destroys itself in creating. Nor is the concept of art merely a derivation from a wide variety of instances of art. Nevertheless, Heidegger begins his meditation on the essence of art by looking to how art prevails in the work. By and large, we treat the work of art as a thing. Beethoven's quartets lying in storerooms much like potatoes do in cellars. And artworks are indeed things in some sense. There is something stony about the work of architecture, wooden in a carving, colored in a painting, and spoken in a linguistic work. Heidegger's language here is prosaic, a bit pastoral, but very poetic. The world is full of human-produced things, as well as natural things. The stone in the road is a thing as is the clod in the field. A thing can be defined as anything that exists. But we hesitate to call God a thing or man a thing. We even 
hesitate to call the deer in the forest clearing a thing or the beetle in the grass or the blade of grass. Everything that exists is indeed a thing, but in vastly different senses. For the artist working in a natural medium, the thing can be the matter or hule. They then work on artistically to produce form. The thing is also a substance or that which underlines the hupokaimenon, which is the bearer of properties or accidents, the sumbebekota. The ancient Greek idea of the thing as a synthesis of matter and form produces a thing concept that can equally be applied to things of nature and the products of human art. Heidegger sums up his discussion of the thing by stating that the thing is three things in Western philosophy. One, the bearer of traits or properties. Two, the unity of the manifold of sensations, that is, an impression. And three, a formed matter. In order to understand the artwork as a thing, we must know these understandings of the thing and at the same time keep them at a distance. Why? Because the specific type of thing that the artwork is is determined by its character as a work. The artwork is not reducible to the metaphysical understanding of the thing, but it has a specific type of work being that thrives and discloses the world insofar as it is in and of the world and brings the world to appearance. In the first version of the essay, Heidegger goes on to give some examples, writing, let us step before works of great art, before the Aegina sculptures in the Munich collection, before the Barbella of Strasbourg, or into the realm of Sophocles' Antigone. When we attempt this, the works are transposed from their proper location and original space. The role they played as work beings in preserving and disclosing the world is transposed into mere art objects, which then become the object of lived experience. We can still be inspired by the magnificent German cathedrals, and yet the world in which they were created has long since decayed and withdrawn. The temple work was originally a sanctuary for the appearance and disappearance of the goddess Aphia. The pedimental sculptures revealing the mythic presence of the gods and heroes, and the performance in the tragic theater, being a ritual explicitly designed to reinvoke the god. The world in which these works of art sprung up and had their origin and essence is more or less wholly lost to us, as is the experience that Van Gogh had when he painted his Starry Night, as is the world-embedded context from which he painted the famous pair of shoes. Back to the third version, he writes, There is nothing surrounding this pair of peasant shoes, in or to which they might belong, only an undefined space. There are not even clods of soil from the field or the field path sticking to them, which would at least hint at their use, a pair of peasant shoes and nothing more. And yet, this is where Heidegger dares to envision what the shoes might in fact reveal. And it is these paragraphs that Shapiro ridicules in his critique of Heidegger. And yet to understand Heidegger's philosophical intention here, we have to go back to the first version of the essay. The point is not divination for Heidegger and assertion of world context for the shoes is simply to point out that the work itself is already deworlded, and so we have to return to the origin of the work in terms of the world that it sets up. For Heidegger, the work of art is set up in the sense of an erecting that is essentially different from mere housing and installation. Originally, in the temple work, art was an erecting in the sense of dedication and praise. To dedicate means to consecrate in the sense that in the work-like presentation, the holy is opened as holy and the God rested into the openness of his presence. Every setting up of the world of the work is also an establishing. Of what? Of that towering in which the world is broken open and placed to abide in as opened. World is not, for Heidegger, the accumulation of things at hand or the merely thought. The world in which we live is neither the sum of all things nor their framing but the world happens, or worlds. It surrounds our existence as that wherein leisure and haste, remoteness and proximity, expanse and narrowness of all beings remain open. The opening of world is always our sojourning within a world, or being in the world. For Heidegger, the work being of the artwork sets up, breaks the world open, and brings the open to stand and to remain as worlding. It is not that the work being of art and the world opened up are two separate things, but rather that the work being is itself a being disclosed. The work is not intended to garner publicity or often leaked kind, but rather openness itself, often bar kind. 
The world opened up and the work being is not for the audience that drifts around in the art business. The work's only relation to the world of the spectators is to break their world open. And this is what measures the greatness of an artwork. What the work of art entails is, according to Heidegger, a superior refusal of what is commonly present at hand, setting forth in a medium, setting forth as expression, setting forth as form. All these concepts of art fail to fully understand the essence of art as a refusal of the present that holds open the time place space. It is true that the artwork always exists in a medium, always sets forth a form, and is always an expression. But the art object's work being is far from exhausted by these conceptual definitions. Heidegger goes on to try to understand all three of them more fundamentally. As set in a medium, art always has the properties of matter. Durability or flexibility, luminosity or darkness, the sounding of tone, the power of the word, weight, gleam, stand, pliability, rush and flood, etc. All these mediums in which art plays out bespeak the earthly character of the work, bringing the media of earth into unison in an unsurpassable plenitude. This is where Heidegger introduces some of the most obscure and interesting thoughts in his Origin of the Work of Art essay. If the work being of the art object is designed to disclose a world, it does so always on the basis of its material medium. What is happening in the work of art is an essential relationship between the earth and the world. So Heidegger goes on to discuss the earth. The earth is not a deposited mass of materials, nor is it the planet, but rather the harmony of mountain and sea, of storm and air, of trees and grass, of the eagle and the horse. The earth unfolds a constant plenitude of forms, and yet always takes what is unfolded back into itself and shelters it there. Heidegger defines the earth as a self-concealing or temporal setting forth into openness, into world. The artwork consists of earth and endures the setting back into earth which closes itself off and opens up the worlds at the same time. Both essential characteristics of the work being of the work, setting up as towering opening up of a world and setting forth as retreating preservation of the earth, are not incidentally joined in the work but stand in an essential relation. What Heidegger means by the relationship of world and earth in the artwork, and especially his positing of a fundamental strife or battle between world and earth, is notoriously obscure and difficult, and likely inaccessible to a first cursory reading of the artwork essay in any version. One could charge that Heidegger is not talking about art at all here, but of his private mysticism regarding what great art should be and should do. Nevertheless, for the careful student of the philosophy of art and Western aesthetics, from Plato to Heidegger, it must be noted that what Heidegger means by world and earth is not really so different or in such a different sphere of investigation than Schiller's form drive and sense drive. In fact, immediately after situating the work being of the art object, in terms of the strife of world and earth, interestingly, part of Heidegger's target is the representational or mimetic theory of art as well as the representational theory of truth. For Heidegger, we misunderstand truth when we think it merely to be the correctness of our mental representations or the correspondence of ideas with things. What truth really is thought more fundamentally is unconcealedness, or the opening up of a world in its contestation with the earth as self-concealing. So in order to understand Heidegger's claim that the artwork is truth set to work, we simply must learn the very specific way in which Heidegger uses the term truth. Truth for Heidegger is now a clearing or lichtung, concealing and unconcealing at the same time. Art is a major way in which truth appears in the world, to wit, it appears as set into the work that opens truth up. Beauty as a shining forth in the work that also self-conceals in the earth of the work is one of the ways in which truth occurs in art. This points for Heidegger to one of the most pervasive and uncanny wonders of modern life, that we are everywhere surrounded by great works of art, and yet seldom permit ourselves the time, effort, or sojourn required so that these works can open up their world to us. Heidegger thus speaks famously with Rilke indirectly of the solitude of every artwork, achieving its delimited boundary or enclosure as a work. Every work of art withdraws into the status of a thing. Quote, the more a work achieves what we call effect, the more secluded it must become. 
So what is the origin of the work being of the art object? For Heidegger, it is not the subject or expression, but art itself that is the origin of the work. And like every other thinker we studied in this course, Heidegger defines the essence of art as poetry or poesis. The difference here being that poesis is not defined merely as a bringing forth of something from nothing, but as a setting into the work of truth or the world. Truth is never read off from that which is already at hand, rather the openness of beings occurs by being projected, by being poeticized. All art is in essence poetry, i.e. the breaking open of that open in which everything is otherwise than usual. Heidegger goes on to understand architecture, visual arts, music, all the arts, as various forms of dictum or poetizing. In a classic moment when the philosopher thinks he knows more than the art historian, he writes that the determination of art as expression or expressionism is not incorrect, but it is just as indisputable as the statement that the motorcycle is something that makes noise. Every mechanic would laugh at such a determination of the essence of the machine. But no one would laugh when it has been said for a long time that art is expression. Certainly, the Acropolis is an expression of the Greeks, and Namburg Cathedral an expression of the Germans, and it just as the Ba is an expression of the sheep. The work is not art because it is an expression. Rather, it is an expression because it is a work. What in fact sets the work being to work is poesis, or art, which Heidegger calls a projective saga of being itself, or truth, as well as primordial meaning, or language. The being of the work is only subsequently defined as expression. And the full essence of poesis or art comes to light in the statement, poetry, the essence of art, the founding of being. There is so much more to explore and to criticize in the rest of Heidegger's origin of the work of art essay, and Heidegger's conception of poetry or art as founding being has indeed received even more criticism than his conception of the happening of truth in art as a strife of world and earth. Let us turn now to a contemporary Heidegger scholar teaching at the University of New Mexico, Ian Thompson, who not too long ago wrote a book on Heidegger art and postmodernity. His previous book was on the relationship of Heidegger's philosophy to the philosophy of education, participated in one of the few Heidegger documentaries out there, uh, working with Tao Ruspoli to create Being in the World. Thompson situates Heidegger's philosophy of art as a critique of modern aesthetics. A bit like Rilke's critique of art criticism in the Letters to a Young Poet, he begins with an epigraph from Barrett Newman. Aesthetics is for the artist as ornithology is for the birds, as well as from Heidegger. In order to understand what the work of art and poetry are as such, philosophy must first break the habit of grasping the problem of art as one of aesthetics. Heidegger is against the modern tradition of philosophical aesthetics because he is for the true work of art, which he argues the aesthetic approach to art eclipses. There has been, at least until Thompson's book, relatively little scrutiny of Heidegger's attempt to free the concept of art and its status as an aesthetic category. Heidegger's philosophy of art can be understood as seeking to build a bridge from a particular or ontic work of art, such as The Shoes by Vincent van Gogh, to the ontological truth of art in general, what art reveals essentially as being. So in Thompson, we find the best explanation and analysis of the long-standing controversy surrounding Heidegger's interpretation of Van Gogh. For Heidegger, aesthetics is an oxymoron. The only way to get beyond aesthetics is to first understand how it shapes us and then seek to pass through and beyond that influence, thereby getting over it as one might recover from a serious illness. What aesthetics eclipses is the role that artworks quietly play in forming and informing our historical worlds. Heidegger's critique of the aestheticization of art should not be confused with aestheticism, a term standardly taken to refer to the art for art's sake movement. Art gets aestheticized more broadly whenever it is fully disconnected as a separate sphere from politics, philosophy, and other history-shaping movements. Heidegger's understanding of the role of art is resolutely populist but with revolutionary aspirations. Art for Heidegger grounds history by allowing truth to spring forth and blasting open our world. Thompson as well looks to Heidegger on the temple work as opening up a historical sense of what matters that philosophy and religion subsequently disseminates. Rather than rejecting Heidegger's notion of ontological historicity or the history of being as obscurantism, 
He notes that humanity's fundamental sense of reality indeed does change over time and sometimes very dramatically, and that works of art help explain the emergence of these historical transformations. Great art works by selectively focusing a historical community's tacit sense of what is and what matters. Artworks for Thompson thus serve as ontological paradigms, serving their communities as models of and models for reality. And there are three types of ontological paradigm that the work of art models. Micro paradigms, or things thinging, paradigmatic artworks like Van Gogh's painting and Hedlin's poetry, which disclose how art itself works, and macro paradigmatic, or great works of art like the Greek temple, tragic drama, Goethe's Faust, etc. Whenever great art happens, Heidegger writes, there is a beginning, a push or thrust entering history and history either starts up or starts again. Thompson interprets this to mean that great art is literally revolutionary, capable of overcoming the inertia of traditions by jolting the interconnected ontological and ethical wheels of history into motion. Due to the aestheticization of art, late moderns have forgotten these paradigmatic functions of art, turning art into an enjoyment that serves to satisfy the refined taste of connoisseurs and aesthetes. For us today, he writes, art belongs in the domain of the pastry chef. Thompson comments, the fact that our culture blithely celebrates cafe baristas who compete over the art of pouring foamed milk into our cappuccinos suggests that we have lost sight of the role art can play in shaping history at the deepest level. Modern aesthetics is to be critiqued for Heidegger because it is posited in terms of the distinction between subject and object, specifically as a relation of feeling towards the object. Of course, the subject-object dichotomy forms the very basis of the modern worldview. What's the problem here? When art gets pushed into the horizon of aesthetics, this means one, that the artwork becomes an object of lived experience, and two, art comes to count as an expression of human life. Thus, when artworks become objects for subjects to have particularly meaningful experiences of, these artworks themselves also get understood as meaningful expressions of an artist's subjective life experiences. Thompson comments, this isomorphism of aesthetic expression and impression may not apply too well to surrealism, data, fluxus, and their heirs, but even Duchamp's fountain is most often celebrated as an extreme expression of Duchamp's own artistic subjectivity. Within modern aesthetics, art objects express and intensify a subject's experiences of life. And there are five essential symptoms or phenomena that come along with this subjectification of art. The first four being the historical ascendance of science, technology, aesthetics, and culture. And the fifth being the historical decline of the divine that Heidegger, echoing Schiller, calls the ungodding or de-godification disenchantment of the world. Subjectivism is a problem because it designates humanity's increasingly global quest to achieve complete control over every aspect of objective reality and to establish ourselves as the being who gives the measure and provides the guidelines for everything that is. Now Heidegger does not deny the reality of the subject-object relation, but instead points out that our experiences of this relation derives from and presuppose a more fundamental level of experience, a primordial modality of engaged existence in which self and world, if not also earth and sky, are united rather than divided. Aesthetic subjectivism comes up against its own essence and limits in its attempt to enframe the world. Thompson discusses the University of New Mexico's prestigious Mind Institute, where subjects are given beautiful images to look at and the resulting neuronal activity in their brain is studied empirically using one of the world's most powerful functional magnetic resonance imaging machines. In this way, as Heidegger predicted in 1937, aesthetics becomes a psychology that proceeds in the manner of the natural sciences, that is, states of feeling become self-evident facts to be subjected to experiment, observation, and measurement. Hilariously, Van Gogh's shoes, according to this experiment, only received a 5.5 out of 100 score for overall aesthetic value. Art may be dying, but it is far from dead. Art no longer counts for us as the highest manner in which truth obtains existence for itself in its highest determination, vocation, and purpose. And thus art remains for us, as it was for Hegel, a thing of the past. Still, Heidegger nurtures the hope that past Hegel, the distinctive truth manifest in art could once again attain the kind of history-transforming importance Hegel and Heidegger agreed it had for the ancient Greeks but has lost in the modern world.
For Thompson, what he means by Heidegger's postmodern understanding of art, not at all a relativism, skepticism, or suspicion regarding all meta narratives. Thompson uses the word postmodern in a temporal historical sense, related to what comes after the modern, that is, the new ontology that would no longer understand entities as modern objects to be controlled or as late modern resources to be optimized. According to Heidegger's postmodern, in a literal sense, understanding of art, the essence of art consists in the artist possessing the essential insight for the possible, for bringing hidden possibilities of what is into the work and thereby making human beings first able to see what that with which they blindly busy themselves really is. As Van Gogh says in a letter of Theo, to be an artist is to devote one's life to expressing the poetry hidden in things. So the criticism of Heidegger's origin of the work of art essay focus on its macro paradigmatic function for art, the founding of being, the rebeginning of history, etc. Overlooked in these analysis is Heidegger's serious interest in micro paradigmatic and paradigmatic artworks. In fact, dismisses some nostalgic return to the Greek world as impossible because the ancient temple, just like the medieval cathedral, has been deworlded. Heidegger's hope is that through works like Vincent van Gogh's The Pair of Boots, we'll learn again the non-aesthetic encounter. Come to understand the being of entities not as modern objects or as late modern resources, but in a genuinely postmodern way, thereby inaugurating another historical beginning. Quipping on a famous statement of Kant's, Thompson writes, an artwork without an interpretive community remains mute, and an interpretive community without an artwork remains blind. We like to believe that humanity is well on its way to mastering the universe, but art teaches us that we will never exhaust the possibilities inherent in what we like to call reality. Art teaches us to embrace the initially tragic insight that being will never be completely revealed in time as the very thing that makes it possible for human beings to continue to understand what is in new and more meaningful ways. Unfortunately, everything truly original or primordial gets glossed over as something long familiar, and every mystery loses its power. Thompson comments that it is indeed very difficult to present the type of deep truths that derive from personal existential struggle. According to Thompson, with world and earth, Heidegger seeks to name and so render visible the quietly conflictual structure at the heart of human intelligibility, the unified opposition that allows being to be disclosed in time. The earth is his response to the problem that all creation or poesis is taken as ex nihilo. The rest of this chapter by Thompson and his next chapter are both highly readable and easy to digest, so I'm going to let you read the rest of these essays on your own. See you next week!